Who are some of the dumbest criminals? What happened to their brain? Let's find out, starting with... Number seven, switching industries. Camilla Navarro, known by her stage name, Mia Echeverria, found herself embroiled in a smuggling scandal at Carrasco International Airport in Uruguay. The former adult star and a group of individuals were stopped by police attempting to board a flight to Madrid, Spain. During a routine check, one of the men accompanying Navarro was found to have hidden compartments in his suitcases that contained six kilograms of a white powder. As a result, Navarro was arrested as a co-conspirator. Mia Echevarria was a prominent figure in the adult entertainment industry, having been one of the main stars on Uruguayan adult channel Divas TV. So this wasn't the best career change since there's loads of other less illegal ways she could have been making money. Camilla also had a connection to the world of sports, having been in a relationship with Richard Morales, a retired international soccer player with whom she has two daughters. So she wasn't the best example either. Facing charges related to trafficking, Navarro was placed in custody along with the four other suspects while authorities continued their search for a sixth person in relation to the case. Navarro's lawyer, Pablo Casas, said that she was unaware of the contents of the suitcases, vehemently denying any involvement or knowledge of the illicit substances. It's sad that her only option for a career change was to be a mule. If only there were some online platform that rewarded attractive people who were already okay with producing adult content. Someone should make something like that, you know? Number six, the house party. A luxurious mansion in Santa Rosa Beach, Florida, became the site of a wild house party. But the owner who lives there full time with her family wasn't aware that there was going to be a party at her house while she and her family were on vacation. So she wasn't happy to learn that hundreds of teenagers broke into her home and threw an out of control rager. On the night of June 17th, 2022, around 200 teenagers, many of them local high school students, broke into the mansion, which is located in an upscale neighborhood and was listed for $7.9 million on Zillow. These teenagers actually had a huge study party prepping for college exams, were respectful of the property and cleaned up before they left. Just kidding. This went just like you'd expect, including the requisite property damage and theft. The list of stolen items included a $1,500 dollar bottle of ace of spade champagne a eve saint laurent purse valued at thirty five hundred dollars and a football signed by former colts quarterback peyton manning the homeowners avid wine and liquor collectors were devastated as the intruders raided their cellar consuming expensive bottles of tequila including a 1942 don julio and other spirits worth thousands of dollars we're sure the teenagers all appreciated the symphony of flavors and nuance that come with enjoying high-end spirits during the party a makeshift boxing ring was set up in the mansion's foyer and tons of videos were taken. The party goers cheered on as two teenagers exchanged blows while others recorded it with their smart devices and posted it on their TikToks, Snapper Chats, and Instagrams. We know all of these apps because we're hip and cool with the kids. The incident was described as an open house party, a term used to describe unsanctioned parties held in someone else's property without the owner's consent. The party was so successful, even the police were there, but that was after receiving a noise complaint. While the cops were quick to respond, most of the teenagers scattered when they saw flashing lights. You know how that goes. Most of the kids got away. Social media platforms, mainly Snapchat, became instrumental in catching these little vandals. Videos and pictures posted by the kids provided key evidence for identifying those involved, leading to several arrests. The police were relentless in their pursuit of the party goers, with parents, school officials, and neighboring police departments playing a vital role in apprehending the little cherubs. Some of the teenagers were given up by their own parents. As the investigation progressed, the stolen items, including the high-end champagne, designer purses, and other valuables were recovered. So thank heavens for small miracles. Is it considered advice for life to say that if you're doing something illegal, don't take pictures of yourself doing it and post it online? Number five, Cooper's Four. 
four individuals, including two former casino dealers, were indicted for a scheme that involved siphoning over $1 million from craps tables at the Bellagio Resort over two years. The scam, orchestrated by James Russell Cooper Jr. and Mark William Branco, relied on the clever ploy of placing bets at opportune moments. They took advantage of the crowds at craps tables, where they would accept late or unclear bets from accomplices, then discreetly paying out winnings when supervisors weren't paying attention. The thefts went undetected for a pretty long time, but the shady dealer's luck eventually ran out when another dealer became suspicious and snitched, leading to their arrests. Total hater, right? Like, no doubt they shouldn't be stealing. But it's really hard to see a casino as a victim, right? Especially one like the Bellagio. The Nevada State Gaming Control Board says that cheating at casinos isn't all that uncommon, with an average of 350 to 500 people being arrested annually for such offenses. The investigation was thorough, with agents spending countless hours reviewing security footage. It's dumb that the dealers thought they wouldn't get caught, since casinos are literally covered in cameras and everything's recorded on video. As a result of the investigation, a 60-count indictment was filed against the four individuals, outlining the charges of cheating, at gambling, and theft. If convicted, they could face lengthy prison sentences, proving that attempting to beat the house at its own game is never a wise gamble. Here's the thing about Vegas. Those impressive casinos weren't built because everybody wins. The only time ripping off a casino worked out okay was in Ocean's Eleven. And even then, it only worked out because no one bothered watching any of the sequels. Number four, Jagged Little Embedded. Bezler. Jonathan Todd Schwartz former business manager made headlines for committing embezzlement that targeted high-profile clients, including the iconic singer-songwriter Alanis Morissette. Schwartz's theft resulted in significant financial losses and tarnished his once prominent reputation in the entertainment industry. Alanis Morissette, a Canadian singer and songwriter, rose to fame in the late 90s with her hit album Jagged Little Pill, which sold a staggering 33 million copies worldwide. Known for her chart-topping songs like You Oughta Know, Ironic, and Hand in My my pocket, Morissette's success made her a sought-after artist with immense wealth to manage. Seriously, if you were around in the 90s, you ought to know how good that album was. Maybe we're Alanis fans, and maybe we like Hootie and the Blowfish too, but uh, let's not get too carried away. Schwartz, who managed Morissette's finances, admitted to stealing nearly $4.8 million from the singer between May 2010 and January 2014. And Morissette wasn't his only victim, as he embezzled over $2 million from five other unnamed clients during his 10 at GSO Business Management, a firm that also represented Katy Perry, 50 Cent, and Tom Petty. Schwartz's theft cost the firm at least $2 million above what their insurance covered. The financial fallout also led to approximately $20 million in losses due to the severe blow to the company's reputation and resulted in the layoff of about a dozen employees. At the peak of his career, Schwartz was making an impressive salary of $1.2 million a year, but somehow that wasn't enough for him. His glamorous lifestyle came at the expense of his clients' trust and financial security. To make matters worse, instead of buying a house or something with the stolen money, instead he squandered it on a lavish lifestyle including sports betting and contraband. Schwartz's crimes went undetected for a long time, until a new money manager hired by Morissette uncovered the embezzlement. The discovery prompted a series of wild accusations from Schwartz, including claims that Morissette was struggling with drug addiction and mental instability. However, these attempts to divert attention from his criminal activities didn't work out. In court, Schwartz Schwartz blamed his actions on a gambling addiction, but prosecutors dismissed this as a mere excuse. They argued that he used the stolen funds to finance an extravagant lifestyle, showing little remorse for the lives he had affected with his actions. Ultimately, Schwartz was sentenced to six years in federal prison for his wire fraud and tax crimes. Additionally, he was ordered to pay $8.6 million in restitution, seeking to compensate his victims for the financial and emotional damage he caused. If Alanis is still in need of representation, we're sure Dave Coulier isn't doing too much these days. Number three, the kitchen con. Kevin Cairns from the United Kingdom engaged in a heartless scheme to swindle Daniel Jones, a dying soccer coach of 12,500 pounds. Cairns befriended Jones after somehow learning about Jones's critical illness insurance payout he received due to a brain tumor. Taking advantage of the situation, Cairns posed as a friend and even accompanied Jones to the hospital for chemotherapy treatments. During this time, Cairns plotted to deceive Jones into paying him 12,500 pounds for a new kitchen Cairns was going to install. Mr. and Mrs. Jones had their old 
kitchen gutted the day before the new one was to be fitted, but Karen's never delivered. This left the stressed and grieving couple and their young children with no place to store or prepare food. Tragically, Mr. Jones passed away in March of the following year, making Karen's heartless scam even more appalling. Despite knowing that Jones was terminally ill and facing a difficult time, Karen showed zero remorse for his actions during his court appearance. Karen's and his wife Jillian were involved in many more scams. In 2016 and 2017, they conned three other individuals out of approximately 20,000 pounds for furniture and kitchen refits that they never provided. The couple operated under different company names, including Handcrafted in England and Bartow and Mason, and sold furniture and kitchens. Karen's was sentenced to four years and three months in jail after pleading guilty to fraud at Chester Crown Court. The judge scathingly described Karen's as truly despicable for targeting a terminally ill man and his family and displaying no remorse. Jillian received a 10-month suspended sentence with unpaid work and rehabilitation activity required. What was the end game with this, though? You can't just have someone remove their entire kitchen and then just walk away with their money and think you're not going to get caught. And the victims couldn't be more sympathetic. Kevin Karen should get the most brainless award for this video. Number two, trusting reformed scammers. Jared Hain, a former National Rugby League star, found himself entangled in a financial fraud after allegedly being duped by a fellow inmate during a three-year stint in prison. While serving his time, Hain met a man named Ishan Sinir Sapidin. Ishan made promises of Bitcoin investment opportunities with high returns. He backed up his claims by saying he'd previously earned millions for clients while working alongside Australian billionaire Mike Cannon Brooks. Sapidin managed to convince at least six inmates, including Hain, to transfer over $2 million to accounts he controlled between 2020 and 2022. The transactions were made outside of prison by individuals acting on Sapidin's instructions since the inmates didn't have access to the internet. This isn't Sapidin's first time involved in financial crimes. In 2018, he was convicted of running a Ponzi scheme that swindled $4.6 million from family and friends. Additionally, in 2014, he was banned from providing financial services after conning investors out of $500,000, claiming he had access to Facebook's IPO. The whereabouts of the money transferred by Hain and other inmates remain unknown. It's alleged that Hain had a settlement deed drawn up to protect his investment, but it seems that Sapidin's promises of astronomical returns were empty. Surprise, surprise. So these guys got financial advice in prison from a guy who was in trouble for financial crimes. How could this possibly go wrong? It's really hard to feel bad for any of these people. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here for our past release for more dumb criminals who were caught. Number one, Bayville Adventures Park's new ride, Finley's Fraudulent Fiasco. Donald Finley is a New York businessman and owner of Bayville Adventure Park who pled guilty to misusing federal coronavirus aid. The incident unfolded when Finley obtained over $3.2 million through the Paycheck Protection Program and Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program during the COVID-19 pandemic. Between March 2020 and March 2021, Finley submitted applications for nearly 30 small business loans, capitalizing on the uncertainty faced by many businesses during the pandemic. The money he received was meant to help struggling businesses, and really, owning an amusement park meant he was going to be hit pretty hard. But rather than using the money the way he was supposed to, he diverted a substantial portion for personal use, including buying a home in Massachusetts. The Bayville Adventure Park, located on Long Island's North Shore in Suffolk County, was one of Finley's businesses. It offered a variety of attractions and entertainment for visitors, promising thrilling experiences to guests seeking adventure and fun. Donald Finley's reputation also extended beyond the amusement park industry. He owned the Jekyll and Hyde theme restaurant in Manhattan, which closed down in 2022, like so many other restaurants. Finley's scheme was eventually uncovered, and he admitted to disaster relief fraud and wire fraud during a federal court hearing. As part of his plea agreement, Finley was required to pay restitution of over $3.2 million and a fine of up to $1.25 million. But the adventure didn't end there, as Finley is also facing the possibility of up to 30 years in prison. For a wealthy and successful businessman, it seems pretty stupid to risk everything, doesn't it? It ended up costing him more, and now he might be headed to an un-amusement park. Here are a few shoplifters who aren't very good at what they do. Number 10, the business card. Matthew Crowder ran a Facebook page where he posted pictures from what he called raids. These raids were Crowder speak for shoplifting. In his posts, he bragged about pampering his family with the spoils of his conquests. Crowder made it sound like he was slaying dragons for these items when in reality, he was committing petty theft. 
In 2016, Crowder's poor decision-making came full circle. He walked into another consignment store looking to raid valuable loot. This time, the only treasure that caught his eye was standing behind the counter. The petty thief flirted with the cute cashier. After a moment of conversation, he gave the clerk his business card. Crowder then went back to business as usual and finished his raid. Once the store realized what had happened, they called the police. Thankfully, Crowder did all the work for them. This business-minded burglar left behind a card with his name and address on it. On top of that, he immediately took to Facebook to brag about what he shoplifted. Unfortunately for him, his biggest fans that day were police officers. Officer Dobrik of the Albuquerque Police said it wasn't a surprise because the guys who commit these crimes are usually dumb. He also said to all business in the area that if Crowder walks into their store, he's only there to rip them off. Crowder had outstanding warrants for shoplifting in three other Albuquerque counties. Number 9. The Magnet Thief would-be magnet thief Nicholas Allegretto basically turned himself in when he waltzed into a Cambridge police station to complain about a store owner. Allegretto told police that his image had been used to defame him and cause his family turmoil. His boss saw the picture and fired him on the spot. When the authorities investigated the situation further, Allegretto was promptly arrested. Turns out, he walked into a hardware store and after pretending to shop for a bit, decided to pocket a valuable magnet. He was stopped as he headed towards the exit and worked workers took the magnet back. Allegretto, though, got away. Angry about the shoplifter, the owner made a wanted poster with Allegretto's face on it and put it up in his store. He also posted it to Facebook and the local papers, which was how Allegretto's friends and family recognized him. Feeling like he had been wronged, the magnet-loving crook thought it would be wise to tell the police. After his arrest, Allegretto was hit with over $1,000 in fines. The shopkeeper couldn't believe Allegretto walked into a police station. He told reporters that Allegretto wasn't the sharpest tool in the box. Number 8. Grandma Had Enough in Campbell River, Canada, the local Walmart has a high volume of calls to the authorities. They seem to be a popular target for shoplifters who are willing to do anything to take what they want. One day, somebody's grandma decided she'd had enough. The whole incident was recorded by a man following the criminal. The video starts with the shoplifter ahead of him trying to take his unbagged goods out of the store. When the would-be criminal grabbed his bike, the man with the phone asked him if he was going to pay for his stuff. The shoplifter responded with a yeah while he continued towards the door. However, little did he know, a lone vigilante was already on top of him. Like a giant G appeared in the sky, Grandma pushed her cart in front of the thief and scolded him. Before he could react, Granny grabbed his mask and tore it off. Even with his face exposed, he still tried to take the cart. However, seemingly emboldened by Grandma's bravery, the cameraman grabbed the criminal's cart. After a brief struggle, he let go of the carriage and opted for his backpack instead. The thief rode off empty-handed with nothing but shame after Grandma thwarted his pathetic robbery attempt. Number 7. The Purse in Hillsboro, Oregon, Sarah Michelle Jarvis struggled with a man over her purse. She yanked on it desperately, trying to pull it from his grasp. However, the man's strength was too much for Sarah, and she was clearly fighting a losing battle. It sounds like the opening scene to a Marvel movie, but not everything is always as it seems. In a now viral YouTube video, the altercation kicks off with Sarah and a seemingly random man struggling over a purse at Rite Aid. Sarah had stashed some product in her bag, and a loss and prevention employee caught her red-handed. He chased her into the park parking lot and then dragged her back into the store by her purse straps. The situation escalated when Sarah started kicking and punching him. That wasn't a good idea and he took her to the ground. She flopped and kicked around for a bit before jumping back to her feet and releasing the purse. She tried to leave but walked right into a waiting officer's arms. The first question that comes to mind is, why didn't she just let the purse go and run? The man was clearly much stronger and she had no chance of leaving with the bag. While we can only speculate, the reason seems obvious if you listen closely to the beginning of their struggle. Sarah told the loss prevention officer that he shouldn't take people's purses or their Percocets. The want for her drugs could explain why she fought so hard for the bag and her erratic behavior. Even with the video evidence, the charges were dropped and she walked away scot-free. Number 6. TV for Nowhere John Ray Lomack is a name steeped in infamy at a Target in downtown Seattle. The homeless man was marked as a prolific shoplifter. He gained this title by hitting the same store over 20 times and getting away with around $6,000 worth of products. In the previous incidents, he even hurt some employees while escaping with his ill-gotten gains. This prompted Target to ban him from the store and instruct their employees to call the police if he showed his face. This didn't stop this confident criminal as he walked in again with a mask covering his face. He was still recognized though, and the cops 
cops were called as he was obviously scoping out a 70-inch TV. Lomac headed straight for the exit with the oversized TV on his cart, but security met him at the door. They didn't fight with him, but they did grab the TV and stopped him from pulling it outside. What ensued was a struggle straight out of a late-night comedy sketch. Lomac pulled the TV from different angles while the employees steadily pulled it back. He eventually made it outside and after a short rest, dragged his prize down the street. Lomac's victory was short-lived as the employees found two cops and pointed them in his direction. When confronted by the officers, the homeless man put up a struggle but was apprehended and taken to jail. Despite an overwhelming record of 18 felony convictions, the judge released Lomac with no consequences. Number 5. Marshall's Robber In an arrest that looked more like a WWE match, Franklin Nunez fought off two officers as he desperately tried to escape from the marshals he chose to rob. The officers arrived on the scene to confront Nunez after employees called 911. Before a recent policy change, employees had to wait 30 minutes after witnessing a shoplifting attempt to call 911. You could argue that policy was in place to avoid in-store confrontation. After all, security cameras probably caught them in the act anyway. Nonetheless, the policy got a facelift and employees could call 911 on a shoplifting attempt in progress. Some of the patrons recorded Nunez's handicap match with police and posted it to many social media sites. In the video, you can see Nunez stiff arm one officer while fending off another. They eventually bring him down where the struggle continues. Some sources report that Nunez appeared to be going for the officer's weapon in the video, although there's no confirmation. Nunez rises up like the Undertaker and shakes off both officers as he runs out the door. This seemingly superhuman shoplifter was only caught after 10 more officers showed up. Number 4. New York Shoplifting King Isaac Rodriguez found out how heavy the proverbial crown is after becoming the shoplifting king of New York. Like a reverse Robin Hood, surrounded by concrete and only taking for himself, Rodriguez went on a roll during his spree. He broke New York's record for most retail theft arrests with a whopping 46 and was arrested 57 times total in 2021. Those arrests included several other charges, including some violent ones. However, Rodriguez kept getting thrown back on the street. The police commissioner blamed new bail reform laws for the spike in crime. The items the klepto king chose to steal were the weirdest part. He lifted random things like soap, baby formula, and lingerie. Rodriguez often came to the same store several times in one day. Walgreens alone felt the wrath of the king 37 times in one year. How he carried out his crimes was pretty interesting. Rodriguez had no elaborate plan or scheme to fall back on. Instead, he just walked into a store and began filling a bag up. When it was full, the King of Thieves walked on out like he owned the place. The King finally landed in jail when a judge set his bail at $15,000. Good luck stealing and reselling enough body lotion to pay that off. Number 3. Grand Theft Gucci Ekaterina Zarkova California resident loved luxury so much that she was arrested twice for stealing a ridiculous amount of designer goods. Zarkova's scheme was relatively simple. She walked into a TJ Maxx or Nordstrom in Orange County. Zarkova whipped out empty shopping bags and filled them up when no one was looking. She kept this up for over a month without any real resistance and made off with thousands worth of designer products. She might have kept going unchecked if the investigator that witnessed her crimes wasn't in the right place at the right time. Zarkova wasn't just stealing the products to feel like an heiress with a large inheritance. Her plans were more entrepreneurial in nature. She took all her stolen items and tried to sell them on an online consignment store. If she hadn't been caught, she could have made a lot of money doing so. Zarkova stole over $300,000 worth of designer products from TJ Maxx and Nordstrom in the short month she was operating. Her spree was ended by an investigator who caught her red-handed and arrested her. Apparently, this wasn't Zarkova's first dance with the law. She had been arrested in March for a similar crime. In that instance, she was caught with over $950 in products and a tool to remove tags from items. She was released on a $20,000 bail in order to appear in court for her arraignment. When Zarkova didn't show for her first court date, a judge issued a warrant for her arrest. The authorities also got a warrant for her car and apartment where they found her secret stash of products. This prompted another arrest and a much steeper bail set at $320,000. Zarkova was charged with four felony counts of grand theft, seven misdemeanor counts a petty theft, and one felony count of receiving stolen property. If convicted on all charges, she could get nine years in prison. The Orange County District Attorney, Todd Spitzer, seemed fired up by the situation and put out a stern warning to any would-be criminals. He expressed that these crimes were not victimless. If anyone commits these acts under his watch, they will be arrested and prosecuted.
Number two, integrity control officer. NYPD Sergeant Eva Pena must have thought she was above the law. On an average September night in 2019, Pena strolled into a Macy's department store and decided the brand name clothing she wanted was too expensive to pay for. Instead of putting it back on the rack, CCTV footage captured her removing the price tags and stuffing the clothing in her purse. Her haul? Six different items from guests and Tommy Hilfinger, totaling $360. Here's the kicker. As a sergeant in the NYPD, Pena made just over $100 thousand dollars per year overseeing the Bronx Housing Authority. According to the New York Post, her role involved integrity control officer, and she'd recommend punishments for those beneath her who committed small infractions. She also posed for pictures with Commissioner James O'Neill at a recent police event. Did she really think she was above the law, or did she have some kind of leverage on O'Neill, leverage enough to warrant petty theft she clearly could have afforded? Loss prevention officers at Macy's caught Pena red-handed on CCTV. They detained her in a security office and called the police. About an hour later, Pena was suspended from her role with the NYPD. The following Friday, Pena drove herself to court in a white Mercedes-Benz with a $1,000 Louis Vuitton in hand. Perhaps flaunting her wealth could actually help her case? If people see how well off she is, maybe they'd question why she'd shoplift in the first place. Either way, she walked into the courtroom with a wide smile, stood by her lawyer's side, and pleaded not guilty. Number one, San Fran shoplifting queen. In just 13 months, Aziza Graves was arrested and charged after shoplifting from Target 120 times, making off with over $40,000 worth of products during her crime spree. She used the self-checkout lane, paid between one cent and one dollar, then left before the sale was completed. Police finally caught up to her in November of 2021, but a judge released her on bail. The judge requested she wear an ankle bracelet, but the shoplifting queen of San Francisco had other ideas. She never wore the ankle bracelet and went right back to stealing. Thankfully, she didn't get far. Police caught her in the act a month later. This time, they insisted that Aziza be held without bail. Clearly, she has no intentions of being an upstanding citizen. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you think is dumber, giving a reform scammer your money to invest, or inviting two girls you just met in Vegas back to your hotel room where you have over 100K in cash and jewelry.